whirring, growling teeth, titanic shuddering blows, screaming, howling rage. Precept Ibrahim il Farad could do nothing but stare at the bunker's blast doors. The doors shuddered in their plasteel frame with every bang, loosing jagged flecks of grated metal. Another strike, and the doors seemed to buckle, splitting steel dust that fell in sheens of glinting grey. To his left, Administrator Tahik placed a pistol in her mouth and pulled the trigger. The Precept shuddered as blood splattered across his cheek. He thought he could see the whirring blades of the chain axe now, clawing through the door. He had heard tales of the weapon. Widowmaker. Ilfarad thought of his wife, cowering in the back rooms with his infant son. The precept heard another gunshot come from inside the bunker. Its echoes mingled with the prayers of his staff, muttered, whispered pleas to the eight fire spirits of the Divine Sands. The blast door sagged for one stretched out moment before they split in two and slammed against the floor. A giant charged through the destruction, howling as it set upon the precept and bifurcated him vertically in one immense strike of its axe. In the brief second before Ilfarad died, he reflected that the monster's howl was not what he had expected. Before he died, Ilfarad thought that it had been a howl of anguish rather than rage. Angron, Primarch of the Twelfth Legion and Lord of the Red Sands brooded in the remains of the enemy's high command bunker. He was surrounded by the torn apart corpses of the dead. There were no survivors. He stared at the bunker's cogitator intelligences that automatically summarized garbled Vox reports for the enemy. They contained no great surprise. The foe had suffered complete collapse on a hundred different fronts desperate retreats and aborted consolidations. Utter breakdown of morale and command. They were defeated, and the world eaters would hunt down the rest like dogs after terrified mountain rabbits. No quarter would be offered. Just slaughter. Continuing long into the night before the Primarch eventually called off his hounds. Angron panted. A melter lance had caused a great furrow in his side, blackening the armor of Mars and wounding his bioengineered flesh. It was no great matter, just another scar overlaying the triumph rope. That white line of scar tissue that charted each combat victory across his body. The Primarch's enemies had been numerous and well trained, but Angron had killed them all. And then he had killed the High Rider who had sent brave men and women into battle from behind cogitator banks and plasteel doors. The Primarch closed his eyes. Waves of serotonin hormones flooded him with a deep, almost giddy pleasure. The Butcher's nails loosening their screws for a few blessed minutes. But already the Primarch could feel it wearing off, leaving behind a miasmic nothingness. He sighed, trying to hold on to that feeling of feeling, knowing that he could do nothing to prevent its evaporation. And then, just black, treacle sludge. A sudden, mounting fatigue. A dull, grinding pain that started in his temples and twisted his nerves into contorted knots. His face, recently twisted into a furious grin, settled into an empty, flat expression. A feeling of cold rippled down his spine. His shoulders sagged. At the insistent beeping of his vox beat, Angron answered the call. What? Positions are overrun, Father. We're approaching the main civilian population centers. Shall I let loose your hounds? Angron could hear the eagerness to please in Khan's voice. His equerry reminded him of the gladiator Matul. That same strange mix of stubborn defiance and desperate longing for approval. It had taken Matul some convincing to join Angron's rebellion. The Primarch frowned. Matul had lived until the very end. Angron remembered meeting his gaze on Deshalika Ridge. They had nodded to each other, two warriors sharing a gesture of mutual respect, the acceptance of one final battle against the High Riders of Nuceria. Father! Angron thought of the braying crowds that had watched him from the stools above the arenas. There had been so many of them that their faces had blended together. Dusty, sand-swept faces, Weak shoulders pressed together in their swaddling rags. All of them complicit in his slavery. All of them complicit in the killing and the butchery. 
Let them loose, Khan. Kill them all. The Emperor has no use for fire worshippers. Will you join us? Angron paused. He could hear triumphant horns blaring through the vox speed. Something in that noise raised the Primarch's hackles. He heard himself making a low growl, almost a whine. No. The Primarch ended the call, suddenly trembling. Angron was sure he had heard those horns before. He blinked and punched the console in front of him. The force of his blow shattered the cogitator into sparking pieces. But still he heard the same mocking, triumphant blare of horns. Something in Angron's mind snapped, and he was overwhelmed by memory. He lashed out with Widowmaker, a great swipe of blaring teeth cutting apart Onimaeus's flesh. As the old gladiator fell back, Angron grabbed at Onimaeus's head and drove his thumbs through the pulp of their eyes. The gladiator opened his mouth to scream as Angron found the soft flesh of his brain, mouth fizzing bile and blood as Angron slammed their skull again and again against the pommel of a discarded sword. The Primarch could feel floods of intense, driving pleasure blasting through his brain, an overwhelming cathartic release of undiluted rage that obliterated all the pain and despair of his mutilated mind. He released his grip and began punching, slamming his fist into the soft tissue above the ridge of Onomaeus's nose. He punched again and again and again before the bone splintered and all he was punching was wet compacted sand. The crowds were cheering, howling in exultation, horns sounding in a regular discordant noise, blaring louder and louder and louder. He paused. In front of him was the shattered remains of the cogitator banks, fizzing, broken pieces of obliterated machinery. Like Onimaeus, it had not fought back. The Primarch padded down the corridors, indifferent to the devastation he had wrought. Loose limbs and viscera were cast about, staining the floors and the walls with red. His own armor was repainted in arterial blood. When Angron glanced at the gore, he felt nothing but a dull stirring of nostalgia, the shadow of savage release. Just enough feeling to remind him that he barely felt anything at all. He slowly traveled back to the adamant resolve taking a lonely shuttle ride through the planet's orbit. If he had cared to look, he would have seen the city's burning, the mile-wide plumes of black, choking smoke, the burn pits of mass graves. But he had seen such things before. Instead, he just stared at the floor, allowing his thoughts to sink into the sludging murk of his depressive soul. Acting on disassociated autopilot, Angron made his way to the Apothecarian, allowing the bustling menials to carefully remove his damaged armor and tend to his wounds beneath. As the medics applied salves to his burns, the nails sang a song of slaughter and bloodshed. Angron imagined breaking the wrist of the one who placed gauze against his skin, throwing them through the medical gurneys, reaching for Widowmaker and killing, killing, killing them all, rampaging across his ship, slaying everything he found. Maiming, ripping, tearing. Angron closed his eyes and breathed slow, deliberate breaths. He was loath to repress the only feeling he had left, but he did so anyway. He retired to his chambers early that night, finding no enthusiasm to join the victory feasts. He knew his legion would be hurt by his absence, but he could not bring himself to care. They were not his sons. No more than the Emperor was his father. His father had been named Onimaeus, and Angron had never wanted children of his own. He sat in the darkness, listening to the steady beats of his hearts and the arrhythmic beeps of the spaceship's machinery. Minutes passed, followed by hours. As time crawled onward, Angron tried to stir up some emotion in himself. He thought of the military victory he had just won, but could find nothing to savor. No sense of satisfaction or triumph from the bloody subjugation of the planet below. He thought of his so-called sons, their desperation to please him. But he couldn't dislodge any pity or despair from his hearts. The nails had deadened him to all feeling, 
his world had drained of colour. But there was still time. Still time to join the victory celebrations that would continue deep into the night. Still time to find some shadow of companionship or joy. Angron willed himself to stand, to act, to do something. But the motivation never came. He sat there until he felt tired, and then he lay down on his bed and closed his eyes. Like every night after a battle, Angron slept fitfully and dreamed of home. He was waiting for the Rexium Royal Dragoons, the latest company sent by the High Riders to bring his Eaters of Cities to heal. His stomach was pressed flat against the rough stone of the cliffside, jabbing his flesh as he slowed his breathing to a steady, predatory beat. Ignoring the screaming of the nails, he tested the rope that connected to his harness, pulling it taut against the belay driven into mountainous rock. He glanced to his side, grinning at his fellow gladiators. Like him, they pressed their bodies against the ground, hands itching around the hilts of swords and axes. Beneath them, a winding mountain path forced the Royal Dragoons into a narrow marching formation. Angron heard their trumpets before he saw them, preening fops in their bright blue uniform and pristine military caps. This was not the first army Angron and his gladiators had destroyed, but the enemy was still confident as if the notion of slaves defeating them was utterly unthinkable. Angron breathed. The nails wanted him to attack, to throw himself from the cliffside and sprint towards the enemy's formation. He felt himself inch forwards, his fingers digging into the unyielding metal of his weapon's pommel. Angron! He blinked, glancing back to Hamat. The gladiator's face was a gnarled mess of tough scar tissue. His nose was permanently off-center, crooked where it had been broken too many times to count. A jutting forehead and a strong jawline gave the impression of some murderous beast, but Angron knew Hamant. They had fought together and drank together, and Angron recognized the concern in his brother's eyes. Hamat tapped at his scalp, where the butcher's nails clasped tight like a coiled metal crab. Winding spools of arcane machinery resembled clumps of hair where they spat from beneath the warrior's skull. And yet, Hamat grinned. Don't let the bastards win, my brother. Angron nodded. He forced down the nail's influence and inched back into position. On the other side of the mountain path, an incline of loose scree and boulders hid the other half of Angron's force clutching makeshift blades and scavenged lasguns. They crouched behind cover and held their nerve as the Royal Dragoons marched forwards. Angron could see each of them gritting their teeth, desperately holding back the butcher's nails before the enemy were in prime position. Angron knew it was only a matter of time before someone snapped and bullets began to fly. He focused his growing anger on the Royal Dragoons. Their egg-blue fineries seemed ridiculous against the backdrop of barren rock. They marched in perfect time, Lasgun cradled against their shoulders. So proud. So resplendent. None of these men or women had ever fought in the bloody sands of a gladiatorial pit. None of them had ever experienced real suffering apart from the tame, sanitized exertions of boot camp. The nails pulsed in Angron's head, a small flush of serotonin mingling sweetly with adrenaline waves. The temptation had become almost unbearable. Lazfire spat down at the formation, cutting down a dozen of the Royal Dragoons as the Eaters of Cities screamed in bloody exultation. A couple gladiators abandoned their cover and launched themselves at the soldiers, but the enemy was disciplined, even in the face of ambush. When a trumpet sounded, they turned in perfect formation and a volley of fire left the two gladiators twitching on the ground. The rest of the ambushers scrambled up the rocky slope, Lazfire snapping at their heels as they ducked and weaved from boulder to boulder. Wait! Angron growled. Wait! Having turned to face the ambush, the Royal Dragoons now had their back to the cliffs. They began to advance up the hill, their formation staggering as soldiers slipped and tripped over loose scree. They were too confident in their numbers, too confident in their equipment. 
They did not see the fleeing gladiators for what they were. Only one stage in an elaborate trap. Angron nodded, jumping forwards. He heard rope zip across the metal of his clip harness, abruptly tightening before his belayer provided slack. With reckless speed, he abseiled down the sheer face as if running across flat ground. His cliffside gladiators charged alongside, succumbing to the madness of the butcher's nails and roaring in vengeance and hate. Angron was screaming too, screaming for the gladiators he had been forced to kill, screaming against the horror of his mutilation, screaming for Onomaeus. The enemy's formation was still broken across uneven terrain, sending them sliding and falling on the loose rock when they tried to turn to face the new threat. A few shots cracked past him, but Angron was upon the Royal Dragoons before they could unleash a full volley of fire. He drove his axe into the neck of the first man he reached, decapitating him in a wild swing. A mortal might have been unbalanced by such a reckless strike, but the iron sinews in Angron's arm snapped taut as he redirected his weapon. He hacked into the side of another soldier, and as they fell, he pounced forwards. He battered aside a bayonet thrust and cracked open a skull with a vertical chop. All around him, his eaters of city smashed into the foe, a bloody, predatory claw ripping at a prey beast's exposed belly. The Royal Dragoons had been trained to perfection by a hundred drills, but training did not prepare them for the hack and slash of close quarter gladiatorial combat. Angron screamed as he cut down another man, dodging the swipe of a power sword and punching the officer in the throat to prevent another attack. He felt the man's trachea fracture. Nonetheless, he followed up with an axe blow that severed the arm from the shoulder. Angron could feel the blood sticky and warm across his face, an intense, cathartic delight driving him to ever greater heights of aggression. He stamped hard on the man's chest and sought his next victim. The battle was over quickly. Already the enemy's morale was broken and a bloody massacre was taking place. The surviving Royal Dragoons broke ranks, desperately trying to escape the melee, their pristine uniforms soiled with blood, dirt and piss. One fell to his knees before Angron, begging for mercy even as Angron took their head and slammed it against a rock. Another fled him, howling as Angron's axe buried into their back. Kill! 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 Angron sat on the edge of a gore-strewn boulder, panting for breath. He was surrounded by hundreds of corpses. His gladiators were picking through them, taking blades, guns and ammunition for the battles to come. Angron could feel the hormones draining from his system, the dull ache of miasma reasserting itself over his mutilated mind. Hamat wandered up to him. The gladiator was injured. A long cut opened him up from shoulder blade to gut. Angron glanced up with a grunt. You should get that scene too. Hamat shrugged. He sat beside the Primarch. I've had worse. How many did we lose? A few dozen. Maybe forty. Nothing compared to what we inflicted. They have lives and more to spare. And our supplies are low. I know, Angron. I know. We all understand. But it doesn't matter. This day is ours, and we would not trade it for the years they would offer us in chains. You have given us this day, and that is enough. I wish I could clasp them all in irons. I wish I could mutilate their flesh the way they mutilated ours. We humiliate them, Angron. For the High Riders, maybe that's worse. No. They will forget this humiliation when our dead bodies are just skeletons grinning up at the sun. They will say we were fools. Let them say what they like. We choose freedom. Only a diseased soul can call that foolish. Hamat picked at a clump of dried blood on his leg, thinking... I once spoke to a wise man, a philosopher who visited the cells beneath the arenas of the Shea. He said that the best revenge is to be unlike your enemy. Useless words! 
The man had the privilege of choice. We had no choice. We were forced to kill. Maybe. But still, I don't want to enslave them. I don't want to mutilate their brains. My revenge on them is to be the better man, despite everything they have done to us. Very philosophical, Hamat. But that's blood on your hands, and not all of it is yours. Hamat grinned in reply. I never said I'd let those bastards live, my brother. Angron woke with a start. He had torn the sheets off his bed. His covers were slick with sweat. Hamat was gone. Hamat had died two weeks later after the ambush, succumbing to infection. They had never had enough supplies, never enough food, never enough shelter, never enough medicine. They had been doomed from the start. The Primarch rose slowly. His huge shoulders sagged as a sigh rippled throughout his body. His back was a tapestry of scar tissue knotted like taut rope. He had suffered wounds from every weapon known to humanity. Lasfire, bullets, bolts, blades, even artillery and orbital fire. Angron had suffered them all. He threw on a loose tunic, blind to the holes and rips in the coarse fabric, and stumbled from his quarters. It was late into the night cycle of the adamant resolve and the corridors were silent but for the soft whir of machinery and the occasional groan of a disfigured menial servitor. Angron walked barefoot towards the command decks, hoping to meet no one. The floor grating was cold and sharp against the soles of his feet, a scintilla of pain sending an ice shudder down his back. The Primarch meandered, fighting the urge to return to his room and go back to bed. Everything felt so tiring so tiresome. But Angron did not want to sleep. He did not want to dream once more of his stolen home. Father. Angron grunted at his equerry's greeting, not hiding his annoyance. Khan's shoulders tightened. He had a broad frame, muscular and powerful, but he still seemed small before his Primarch. Spots of blood still stained the marine's white armor, souvenirs of the recent slaughter. Khan advanced, his stance aggressive and defiant. Angron smiled thinly. So many of his dogs would have retreated from Angron's displeasure, but not Khan, a disobedient hound. Out of all the whelps that called themselves his children, Khan irritated Angron least of all. You should have joined us in the slaughter, father. It was a spectacle. I have seen butchery before Khan. The Primarch noted the Aquarius muscles tense, as if the Marine was about to pounce. What? Khan wrinkled his nose into a snarl. You should have been there. You should have celebrated the victory with us. You are supposed to be our commander. Oh, the dogs pine for scraps, do they? Even now, the nails scratched at Angron's mind, urging him to kill. But Angron knew that Khan would neither retreat nor defend himself. For that reason alone, Angron held himself back. When you named us your World Eaters, you committed yourself to lead us. What have we done but obey your commands and kill in your name? What have we done to dishonor or displease you? You displease me by your very nature, Khan. We are made in your image. Perhaps that displeases me as well. That we are in your image. Or do you resent your own reflection? Both. I resent the Emperor's claim upon me as designer and maker, as if I am some instrument he has crafted for his own purpose. I resent my legion. These loyal dogs he has somehow bred from my seed, who have the audacity to call themselves my sons after the sterile rape of my flesh. I resent the explicitness of my purpose, the gene-forged strength of my limbs that steals the glory from my deeds and lays them at the feet of the so-called master of mankind. Who has need of masters, Khan? Dogs and slaves, nothing else. 
We are what we are. I am not his. I do not cede my destiny to the whim of some distant high rider. Out of sheer instinct, Khan's hand shot to the axe at his side. Angron glowered, silently willing his equerry to draw his weapon and face the Primarch in combat. The nails were insistent now, flooding his mind with bursts of adrenaline, sending him to the very brink of violent rage. But Khan's hand moved away from the hilt of his axe. You may not be his father, but we are yours. Is that what you want? To be my dogs? To be my slaves? Should I throw chains on you, whelp? Should I clasp you in collars? Khan's eyes glittered. Angron wasn't sure if he was anguished or furious. Do what you will. We are not ashamed to be made in your image. We are not ashamed to be your dogs, if that's what you insist on calling us. Yes, my war hounds, my eaters of worlds. Ha! I should never have named you thus. I should never have given you the dignity of comparing you to my true brothers and sisters. We serve at your command. Yes, yes, you serve. My true brothers fought alongside me. You fight for me. Well bred. Well trained. The Emperor had it right. War hounds. Dogs. Khan was silent, though Angron could see that the equerry was seething, barely restrained violence shimmering in the air between them. <laughs> Angron slammed his fist into the wall, leaving a great indent in the plastil. He felt his knuckles fracture, the pain letting loose another surge of wrath that he barely repressed. He glared at Khan, but his equerry had not moved, staring at his Primarch with an expression of desperate pain and incandescent fury. The Emperor has made me a High Rider. He has given me a legion and commands me to rule them. I did not want this, Khan. I wanted to die on Deshalika Ridge. I could have died well, a free man, but he denied me that. Once more, I am a gladiator. I am given many trinkets, but a gilded chain is still a chain. Well, if I am a high rider, I must play the part. Isn't that what you said, Khan? That I should not resist the nature my emperor gave me. Very well then, I will become them. I will take back my power. I will break you and mutilate you. I will show the galaxy what you truly are. I will put you in chains, Khan! If that is what you want. Khan replied steadily, though Angron could hear the disappointment and anger beneath his words. So be it. Let my dogs truly be remade in my image, mutilations and all. A command, dog. You want a command? Let it be this. Task the tech marines to begin implementing the butcher's nails across the legion. Let them study and craft devices of torture that resemble mine, and have them collar each dog that dares call himself my son! Angron studied his equerry's reaction. On Khan's face was disgust, outrage and hurt, but there was another emotion in his eyes that disgusted the Primarch to his core. Hope. Hope that by submitting, Angron would accept Khan as his son. As you command, father. Angron waited until Khan had left him and buried his face in his hands. I am sorry, Hamat. I can't. I can't be powerless any longer. I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. He willed himself to sob, to fill his eyes with grief and to collapse like a little boy upon the ground. But even now, the nails were draining the emotion away. The tears would not come. The despair and loss shimmered into nothing, shadowed by a dull, aching pain that Angron would never be able to fully process and feel. The Lord of the Red Sand studied his broken hand, 
Already the Emperor's design was working well, the fractures in his bones closing up and healing into lump and shape. Once, Angron had thought himself tough, resilient, a quick healer. But now he knew the truth. He flinched at the sound of horns in the distance. He did not know if the sound was real, but it felt real to him.